program debate 84 final project number 84 CE 2801007 DTR 25th October 84 transmission 1st October 84 Some seven weeks back, eight teams from five institutions started off on this race to the championship. From that crowd, two teams have emerged to take pride of place in the final this evening. Before this evening is out, the new champions of debate will have been crowned. And to confer that honor on the winning team, we are privileged to have with us this, have with us this evening the chairman of Singapore Broadcasting Corporation, Mr. Wee Kim Wee. We're also honored to have with us in the audience tonight the General Manager of Singapore Broadcasting Corporation. Please welcome Mrs. Wong Lee Siok Tin. <laughs> we would like to welcome, too, the heads and representatives of the various institutions taking part. We would also like you to welcome our kind sponsors of the program. And of course, the most important people themselves, the debaters. We Singaporeans used to be, and probably still are accused of, apathy, all sorts of ap apathy, among them political. Of late, though, the scenario appears to have undergone change in some respects. An increasing number of Singaporeans seem to be speaking up. In the circumstances, certain issues have arisen. What is dissent? What is the most motivation driving those who have been and are speaking up? These are some of the crucial, crucial points that the teams will hopefully address themselves to in tonight's debate. Proposing the motion, we have Nian Polytechnic. And opposing it, we have National University of Singapore, Team 1. <laughs> and to let you know how the motion is worded exactly, that it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. I repeat, that it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. And now to introduce you to our distinguished panel of judges for tonight's debate. Lieutenant Colonel Lim Nyo Chin, Assistant Chief of the General Staff, Plans, Ministry of Defense. Mr. K.S. Raja, Director, Legal Aid Bureau, Ministry of Social Affairs. Mr. Dudley Orr, Director, Richway Company. Let us begin the debate. To define the motion, the first speaker for the proposition, Mr. Roger Wang. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, honorable and distinguished judges, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's motion reads that it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. We, the proposition, maintain that there are two parts in tonight's motion. One, to dissent for the sake of dissent. Two, that it has become fashionable in Singapore to do so. According to the Oxford Dictionary, dissent means to disagree, to criticise, to present a different opinion. To dissent for the sake of dissent, therefore, means to disagree, criticise, present a different opinion because of an interest in or desire for disagreeing. 
Now, to ensure a proper understanding of the language used in tonight's motion, we consulted the eminent linguist, Professor Widdersen of the University of London. He explained that the expression to dissent for the sake of dissent implies that people disagree or criticize not because they believe that the issue is wrong, not because they wish to challenge the rationale behind the issue, but because they just want to comment on the issue. They do not want to be walked, uh, walked over. Now for the second part of the motion, that it has become fashionable in Singapore. This comment must be seen in the context of Singapore history. In the 1950s, strikes and militant dissent against co colonialism. In the 1960s, fights against communism. The dissent for the, the dissent of the 50s and 60s were dissent for a cause. Even at that period, there were some people who dissent for the sake of dissent because they did not know what they were fighting for. In the 1970s, Singaporeans worked hand in hand with our government towards economic development and nation building. Today, we enjoy a higher standard of living. There is, no, there is outstanding growth in our economy, in public housing and in education, among others. With people getting better educated, there is a growing awareness or demand to know what is happening in our country now. So people search for channels where they can discuss national issues and policies. We, the younger generation, want more participation in the major decisions which affect our lives. I quote Dr. Tony Tan on the 20th of October, 1984. Quote, Surely it is better to have a nation of self-confident Singaporean, active, articulate, full of life and energy, than to have a colony of subjects, obedient, passive, and afraid to speak their minds. Unquote. There are now avenues for Singaporeans to express his opinions. My second speaker will tell you more about this. When the Singaporean expresses his opinion, he is more likely to question and oppose the issue. Therefore, he dissents. Now back to the motion. Why do we say it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent? Take the case of Billy, I mean, women's fashion. The pundits of fashion in Paris initiate a style. The media picks it up and publicize it. More and more women see it as attractive. In this, in this way, the style becomes popular, it becomes fashionable, the style becomes the trend. Likewise, the fashion, of this, the fashion for dissent is promoted by the media. The media pub publicize the opinion expressed. More and more people now come forward to speak on issues because they just want to speak on the issues. They want to be noticed, they want to stand out. Dissent for the sake of dissent is not vocal. It's only vocal, excuse me. It's only vocal, but it's also seen in the social behaviour. My third and last speaker will show you how fashionable this is in Singapore. Now, we are not denying that other people do dissent, that people do dissent for other reasons, but among the increasing number of persons who dissent for the sake of dissent, it is the onus of the proposition to prove that it is not fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. Proving that it is this, proving that is dissent for a cause does not negative, does not negate the motion. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang. And to define the motion for the prop opposition, Ms. Lina Ravindran. Ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the proposition give us their definition. They have given us quite an airy-fairy definition of dissent, though they refer to the Oxford Dictionary. Now, if we were to accept that definition, then my grumbling to my father about school and my dressing outlandishly would be dissent. No, let us look at how the word is used. When we talk about dissent, we are talking about something more serious than just mere disagreement, not just mere criticisms or grumblings, because dissent involves criticisms, but not all criticisms are dissent. To qualify as dissent, it must have certain characteristics. Firstly, it must be disagreement with policies of those in authority or power, be it social, religious, political. Secondly, it must be voiced loud enough for it to thirdly have the element of direction, that is, the possibility of it reaching those we are dissenting against. 
Now, political and social philosophers are of the opinion that if you, if you and I sat in a coffee shop and said we grumbled about something and disagreed about something, that is not dissent. It becomes dissent when we voice it loud enough, be it via forum page or feedback programs. Now, the question of the debate today is not whether or not people dissent, but what their motivations are when they dissent. The proposition is trying to show us as mindless Singaporeans who dissent for no rhyme or reason, because this term for the sake of dissent, my proposition, I'll elaborate on that, that connotes an element of self-gratification, some pleasure derived from the mere act of dissent, as opposed to genuine concern for the issues. And we tell you, Singaporeans care enough to dissent. And when we dissent, we dissent because we genuinely believe we have reason to do so. Billy will go on to show you that as of late, we've had lots of issues thrown at us. And of the very fact that these issues are controversial, as Mr. Raja Ritnam himself admits, logically speaking, would elicit some sort of response. Mind you, we're not here to say whether these issues are right or wrong, no. All we say is because they're merely controversial by itself, it elicits response. Now, we recognize that tonight, we are questioning people's motive. And it's very difficult to measure people's motive. Therefore, for today's debate, we would have to look at it against issues that have arisen, scaled against people's reactions to it. Now, naturally, if the proposition could show us a significant number of instances when people reacted disproportionately to the issue, be it insignificant or otherwise, then of course the conclusion would be that Singaporeans are a trigger-happy bunch who just dissent for the sake of dissent. We, on the other hand, would show you instances where, firstly, issues which could have elicited response but didn't, like issues on taxation, issues on women. Secondly, we would show you that there are significant issues that could have elicited more response, but the response was minimal. Now, this is not a bad reflection on Singaporeans, mind you. All it shows that we are not a trigger-happy bunch. Otherwise, we would have jumped on every single little issue. Now, Eleanor will go on to show you that we have had a long history of responsible dissent in Singapore, ever since the time of the Japanese occupation. And what the proposition will be trying to do today is to tell us that the dissent of today, unlike that of yesterday, has suddenly become one of fashion to dissent for the sake of dissent. And we tell you, no, Singaporeans are no different today than we are today, than yesterday. If anything has changed, we have become more mature. And we have higher stakes in society today than we ever had. And just because issues are different today makes it no less important. We are not living in a bed of roses and squealing like little spoiled brats. No, we dissent because we genuinely are concerned to improve our society. She will also show you that by the very nature of us Singaporeans, pragmatic, mature, we do not respect nor do we encourage gas bags. Now, by the very nature of Singaporeans and the environment we live in, even if dissent was fashionable, it would never become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. And also, if we were to accept their loose definition of dissent, our arguments still hold true. People do not dissent for the sake of dissent, but be for reasons, because there are important issues involved. I thank you. For Nian Polytechnic, Mr. Kenneth Law. My dear opposition, dressing outlandishly and grumbling is a form of dissent. Dissent need not be confined to a formal expression of views. For example, it could be argued that the wearing of blue blazers is a form of dissent. And uh, it is not necessary to look at quantity or numbers in order to determine whether something is fashionable or not. After all, we know that drinking wine is fashionable, but how many among us do that? And how can you say that dissent, for the sake of dissent, is irrational? Professor Henry Widdowson of the London University said that the concept of dissent for the sake of dissent is a rational and positive one, like the 19th century concept of art for art's sake. The method may be logical, but it serves no purpose. Mr. Chairman, honorable judges, ladies and gentlemen. A factor contributing to the present trend towards dissent is education. Singaporeans are more literate, well-read, able to question, and generally more critical. Part of this trend is also due to the influence of contemporary Western values, which are against authority and social discipline. 
but it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent, mainly because the government has created a climate conducive to dissent. In the past, it was not fashionable to dissent for the sake of dissent, for fear of government reprisals, but things have changed. Since the 1981 Anson Bai elections, the government has actively encouraged the people to speak up. In 1982, the Prime Minister said that contrary to expectations, an opposition was good both for the people and for the government. Last year, press and public alike were encouraged to speak up on major issues. The PAP offered to print articles from non-party members in its party paper, and SBC introduced feedback, which is a series highlighting issues of public concern. All of us have heard of ministerial walkabouts, but did you know that the government has started a series of talkabouts to get community leaders interested in discussing? The PAP is even finding ways of bringing coffee shop talk into the community centres. Not so long ago, the government decided to create three non-constituency MPs. These three NCMPs will not be able to vote on budgets, no confidence motions or constitutional amendments. In short, they will have no real legislative power. Yes, even at parliamentary level, we shall see dissent for the sake of dissent. And now that a proper climate for dissent has been brought about, people have started to dissent with a vengeance. In 1979, only 5,000 people wrote to the press, but last year, the corresponding figure was 8,300. Now, please take note of this. We are not saying that all these people uh, somehow dissent for the sake of dissent, but the opinions of the opposition notwithstanding, more and more Singaporeans are beginning to enjoy the cut and thrust of debate, which is, after all, dissent for the sake of dissent. <laughs> Let me sum up by using an analogy. The relationship between our government and the people can be likened to that between a father and a child. Father is authoritarian. When his children speak up, he says, shut up and sit down. But later, he realizes that this is not good. His kids are more mature. They can think for themselves. And so he tells them, speak up. Of course, they are reluctant to do so at first. But later, after much encouragement, they become more vocal, they become more critical. They start to speak up because it is the in thing to do. But they don't always speak up on real issues. Often they dissent simply because it has been fashionable to dissent. They dissent for the sake of dissent. It is a fact that the Singapore government has put more thought and planning into its policies than many others. So much so that potential areas for discontent are minimised. But even if the people disagree with some policies, few can offer better solutions and most simply dissent for the sake of dissent. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. And to speak up for the opposition, Mr. Billy Ng. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, Roger. You said that there is a greater level of dissent today. The level of dissent does not play a part tonight. Tonight's motion is not concerned with how much dissent there is, but as to why we dissent. Is it for the sake of dissent, or are there real reasons behind it? Roger, you also said that dissent, a few people dissent for the sake of dissent. Show us that it has become fashionable for the majority of the people to dissent. Or if you can't do that, at least show us that a significant proportion of the people have dissented for dissent's sake. Kenneth, you state that 8,000 people wrote to the press. Let me ask you, how many of these 8,000 people put down their names when they complain? One or two? It's obviously not for self-glorification, not to see their names in their newspapers. How can you say they dissent for dissent's sake when, they, when their names don't even appear in the newspapers? Let me now reiterate Liner's statement that the topic tonight is as to what motivates dissent. Measuring this motivation is a difficult task, and one of the main instruments is to judge people's response to real issues. Let me elaborate on these real issues. Take the CPF scheme, for example. Any changes in the scheme would affect our money, our pockets, our wallets. Please take a closer look and tell me that's not important. 
So too does a foreign made levy and MediSafe. Are these issues not controversial? Do they not affect us directly? How then can you say that we dissent for the sake of dissent when the issues are so close and dear to us? Next, take the issue of graduate mums and streaming in primary school. It concerns our inherent sense of right and wrong. Our friends who are being graded and labelled like turkeys. And some children who can now travel by air through primary school, but some who have to go by sea. The government, by introducing controversial issues, digs up the very embodiment of our ideals and pride. Are these not good enough reasons to dissent for? And continue from last week, the issue of non-constituency MPs. <laughs> the introduction of watchdogs without teeth into parliament is funny enough. But the extermination of these dogs, if their teeth ever grows, is ridiculous. <laughs> can you question our real reasons for dissenting against? <laughs> can you question our real reasons for dissenting against such a policy? Yes, we agree with you. Dissent is a universal language. But we do not do it for its own sake. We Singaporeans, being pragmatic, do not indulge in such meaningless and contemptible acts. But when someone tramples on the finest flower of our civilization, our dignity, or stains the most precious jewel of our nation, our rights, when the very pillars of our society are shaken down by controversial policies, can you then stand up and tell us that we dissent for the sake of dissent when the reasons are so obvious that they strike you in the eye? Furthermore, if you imply that Singaporeans dissent for the sake of dissent, that every tiny little issue will be picked up and dissented against. But the people did not bark furiously when the government prohibited the rearing of big dogs in small flats. In addition, we even argued that there is not enough dissent on some important issues. Look at the minimal dissent when the newspapers were merged or when the penal code was changed. Or worse still, for all of you ladies here, don't you know the difficulty in getting jobs as compared to males? Or the difference in pay even after you get the job? And look at the PAP. Out of 78 seats in parliament held by the PAP, only two are for ladies. Yet, there's never been vigorous dissent on this lopsidedness. My dear proposition, how can you say that people dissent for the sake of dissent when there is not even enough dissent. Ladies and gentlemen, Singapore is a song and it must be sung together. We do not deliberately introduce discord into the song for the sake of hearing discordant notes, but we sometimes interrupt for the true purpose of fine-tuning the important stanzas in the song and making it more harmonious, such that we can all, as Singaporeans, become more united as a nation with a sure hope and trust in ourselves, yesterday, today, and forevermore. I thank you. And to reply for the Polytechnic, Mr. Lim Yu Shi. The first two speakers of the opposition speak as if they are perched on top of an ivory tower. I hope their third and fourth speakers are not like them. But if they are, descend from there and come here and debate on dissent with us. Their case shows a clear pattern, a pattern of no creation. We, the debaters of Nia Polytechnic, present our case in a clear and simple manner. It is not our intention to deceive by dressing up our argument with flowery and elevated language. <laughs> As my first speaker has outlined, I am now going to speak on the behavioural part of dissent for the sake of dissent. Good evening, Mr Chairman, Honourable Judges, ladies and gentlemen. Last weekend, the police launched Operation Roadrunner 2 in order to crack down on hell riders. The number of people rounded up was 1,743. Now, why do these people want to risk life and limb and do something which they know is illegal and that the penalties for doing so is so much stiffer since October the 1st this year? These thrill seekers want to be heroes. They are rebels without a cause. Ladies and gentlemen, dissent for the sake of dissent. <laughs> Let us now go from Changi to Orchard Road. In the 60s, there was rock and roll. In the 70s, there was Saturday Night Fever. And now, in the 80s, we are descending to the ground and breakdancing. 
The authority said no to impromptu break dancing, but the break dancers say, catch me if you can. They play a cat and mouse game with the police, and they consider it trendy to defy the authorities and to get away with it. Isn't that dissent for the sake of dissent? Take a stroll along Orchard Road on Saturday night, and you will see Boy George's here, Michael Jackson's there, and punks everywhere. <laughs> Leather jackets in tropical Singapore, sunglasses at 10 p.m. under street lights, <laughs> hair that has seven colors of the rainbow or more. And aren't these against accepted geographical factors and modes of dressing? Well, it is considered by them to be in, to be out of the norm. McDonald's came, McDonald's saw, and McDonald's conquered. When it first came to Singapore, it not only brought along the, the Big Mac and the idea of fast food, it also created the Small Macs, more popularly known as the McDonald's Kids. Now, what do these McDonald's kids do? Well, the boys watch the girls, and the girls watch the boys who watch the girls go by. <laughs> they can go along with the world, but they prefer to watch the world go. They know that it is not good to spend their time this way, yet they still do so. They are dissenting against the social norm of society, which is the fruitful use of your time. According to reports, there is a rampaging wave of crime sweeping the country. The number of assaults sparked off by persons arguing for no real reasons has increased dramatically. Recently, a taxi driver was assaulted by a passenger. The cause of all this? The taxi driver had insisted rightly that the passenger stop smoking. But did the passenger comply? No, in defiance, he carried on smoking and claimed that it was his right to do so. The result? Another case for the record books. The crux of the matter is, you want your way. You don't want people to tell you what to do. So when the taxi driver told the passenger not to smoke, the passenger carried on smoking and said, I want to smoke, what are you going to do about it? The second speaker talked about quantity of dissent. Mind you, not all break dancers are dissenters. I mean, those people who don't break dance, they do dissent. They write to the press and question the authorities. Why do they want to stop break dancers from dancing? To conclude, we, the proposition, do not deny that there is dissent for other causes, but the motion does not say dissent only for the sake of dissent, but say that it is dissent for the sake of dissent. So it is the job of the opposition not to show that there is dissent for other causes, but that it is not fashionable to dissent for the sake of dissent. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. The third speaker for the university, Ms. Eleanor Wong. Ladies and gentlemen, I do not envy the proposition tonight. We have established that the issues facing our nation are significant and controversial. So the only way they're going to salvage their case is by labelling all of us as noisemakers, slanderers, gas bags, who when faced with real issues are not motivated by a genuine concern, but some perverse bent for self-gratification, which is satisfied by the very act of dissent, some hunger for fame or glory or Freudian flatulence. But they can't do that, so they try to distract your attention. One, they say that people dissent because of increased awareness or an increased perception of what is arguable, but that's not dissent for its own sake. They misread the motion. It's dissent for the sake of arriving at some measure of the truth. Number two, way that they distract your attention. They want to focus on this very low level of what UC would call, I suppose, social dissent, which really boils down to the age-old question of a generation gap. But young people dissent, if you can call it that at all, because one, they are in the process of testing out their ideas and feelings and establishing their own identity. In the process of doing so, they may well adopt cultures that seem alien. You laugh about it, you make jokes about it, but it's a natural part of the growing up process. It's natural and it's necessary and it's beautiful. Number two, 
Young people face genuine issues and problems, and they have sincere opinions to offer. That's why they talk. Number three, adults today allow young people to be seen and heard. The truth about youth proposition is that they descend to ascend, to grow. And ladies and gentlemen, what is true of the youth of today is also true of our nation. Let's look at what really characterises Singaporeans and see whether our souls fit the proposition's shoes. One, we are people with real needs and concerns. They may well have changed over time. We used to struggle against sissies, colonialists and communists. But now that our nation has attained a certain level of economic dependent development, we turn our attention to achieving a better life, to social needs, to education policies, to job satisfaction and cultural enrichment. These concerns cannot be belittled, ladies and gentlemen. They may be even more difficult to solve because unlike the 50s and independence, there, there are no pet or pep answers. Two, we are people with a history of proportionate descent. As Roger has so kindly brought us down history, in the 50s we fought. In the 60s, there were protests. Buses were overturned in the streets. In the relative calm of the 70s, we settled down to earning our NWC wage increases. Today, when troubling questions demand our attention, we write to the press. Or when our MPs walk about, we talk about. Three, we are people more aware, more sophisticated, more educated. And unlike what Kenneth seems to think, because of that, because of that, we have tools with which to formulate our opinions and articulate them genuinely. If we didn't make these grievances hurt, we'd be like hi-fi speakers without a sound base, just tweeters. Four, we are a people living in an environment conducive to constructive criticism. Again, Kenneth has pointed it out. He mentions NCMPs, but the very fact that there is dissatisfaction over the scheme shows you that to the people, it's not enough, it's not fashionable to dissent for the sake of dissent. They want a credible opposition which made its way into parliament by championing issues close to their hearts. They may mention opposition members in parliament, but don't tell me that you really admire an um, empty talker. The proposition may say that due to the relaxed atmosphere, Singapore can, Singaporeans can afford to descend frivolously. But isn't it true that today's Singaporean has as much, if not more, to lose by dissenting? He has a stake in the status quo. Ladies and gentlemen, today's Singaporean is aware, he's level-headed, he's pragmatic. He is not likely to indulge in a self-seeking, self-gratifying outburst of rebellion. In daring to put forward tonight's motion, the proposition, do you, do us, a grave injustice. The judgment must go against them. I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wong. With that, we turn the debate over to the floor. Good evening, I'm Ellery from NP and, well, the first speaker of the opposition has mentioned that there are certain criteria which they use to define dissent. Well, it seems to me that the criteria they use is very vague, it's very subjective. How would you mention vocalness? How much is, how much is loud enough? How loud is loud enough? Who decides? And when you go on to the point of motivation, you say people uh, dissent because they have a belief. Do you not know or have you thoughtfully forgotten the fact that it all depends on which viewpoint you're viewing dissent from. It's a very simple analogy to prove the point. If I hold a coin in front of me, with a head facing me, I'll see a head. But you are standing opposite me. You definitely say you definitely say you see a tail. Thank you. Um, I'm Sanjay Pereira from the National University of Singapore. Now, um, it's very interesting as to what the proposition has brought up today. First, they said that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew encouraged an opposition, implying, for your case, that they wanted an opposition for the sake of just dissenting, for the sake of dissent. But that's not the case. He wanted someone there to make the people more politically conscious. Second, it's very interesting to also note that the third speaker from the proposition has mentioned uh, break dancers, people with sunglasses at 12 o'clock, McDonald kids and all. Yes, very interesting. You've done your homework. You've been hanging around there quite often. You've been reading, you've been reading a lot of little articles in the papers about uh, I mean, not really that little, uh, about the uh, motorbike case and all that. But does that show, in your context, in your case, does that show that 
Singaporeans find it fashionable to dissent for the sake of dissenting. You have not shown that the majority of Singaporeans, not even a significant amount, do that. I don't think that break dancing is a form of dissent. I mean, I do it just for fun. <laughs> now, <laughs> what you have done is a logical fallacy. That is, you have been begging the question to such an extent that if I could go up there, I'll give you a 10 cent coin. Look, you are out to prove that where the McDonald kids and the break dancers are concerned, for example, that that act is a dissent for the sake of dissent. You have not done that. You have assumed your conclusion to be true before even proving it. Now oh, that's bad. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Christopher, I'm from Neon Polytechnic. Uh, what the NUS team has shown us so far is nothing at all. No figures, no facts, no statistics to show us that it is not fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. And uh, I refer to Billy over there. Uh, he said something about those people who write to the forum page, they have a good cause. Let me uh, give you an example. I suppose you have heard about the case when the HDB wants to build a funeral parlor at Clementi. Out of the so many people who wrote in to complain about it, and when HDB gave them a chance to move out of their flats to, another, to other flats, only three of them moved out. Isn't this an example of dissent for the sake of dissent? Thank you. I'm Purani, and I'm not for anyone, but I just have a point to make. In the 50s, we dissented to take away the colonists, and in the 60s, we dissented to wipe out communism. In the 70s, nothing happened. In the 80s, we are descending, I mean dissenting, and to the outsider, when we dissent, and nothing happens to the policies, there's no changes, there's no modification. To an outsider, it seems that we are dissenting for the sake of dissent. Thank you. Thank you for those contributions from the floor. We now bring the debate back to the speakers, the teams. For the opposition this time, Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, there is much confusion that reigns under heaven and earth today because the proposition have completely misunderstood the motion. Today's motion reads that it has become fashionable in Singapore to dissent for the sake of dissent. Dissent is firstly disagreement directed at authority and it can take various forms. Dissent does not include complaints, does not include grumbling. Dissent for the sake of dissent means that the person finds some perverse pleasure in the act itself. He is not concerned with the issue per se. To be fashionable means that people see dissent for the sake of dissent as something desirable, something worth emulating. And today, ladies and gentlemen, the crux of tonight's debate is the motivation for dissent. Why people dissent? If the proposition has proved that tonight there is more dissent in Singapore, that's irrelevant. If they have proven that dissent per se is fashionable, that's irrelevant. They have to prove that dissent for the sake of dissent is fashionable and accepted by Singaporeans in general. The first speaker tries to prove their case by on three points. That Singaporeans like to dissent for the sake of dissent because they are more educated, they have more channels to discuss things, and they want to participate in democracy. Where is the logical nexus, I ask you, ladies and gentlemen? If people are more educated and people care about issues, why should they dissent for the sake of dissenting? They would dissent because they have some valuable contribution to make. Then they say that just because there are more avenues, people will dissent for the sake of dissent. Again, I ask you, where is the logical connection? And then, thirdly, they go on to blame the government for creating a situation where there'll be dissent for the sake of dissent. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you and I, I'm sure, will not believe that our government is so stupid that it wants to create a situation where people will just talk for the sake of talking. Ladies and gentlemen, in a democracy, dissent is a purposeful activity to improve the running of our society. It is a purposeful activity, and the government is encouraging this. It is not encouraging the purposeless activity of dissenting for the sake of dissenting. And then they talk about the purpose of debating. Mr. Kiyas Raja and myself have spent hours in this chamber debating, and I resent the insinuation that it's just dissenting for the sake of dissenting. The purpose of, an edu of a debate is to entertain, to educate, to train the mind, to see both sides of an issue and to arrive at a closer approximation of the truth. We are not dissenting for the sake of dissenting. Are you saying, that all Singaporeans have got no good suggestions and no role into play in a democracy. Are you saying that everyone who writes to the press is wasting his time? They talk about social behaviour, they talk about 
hell riders, but that's just enjoying the thrills of speed. They talk about breakdancing and dressing up weirdly. That's an example of cultural colonization. It does not mean people are dissenting for the sake of dissenting. They talk about McDonald's kids and all that. Boys watching girls, they've always been doing this. <laughs> then, they talk, then they talk about assault on taxi drivers. I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that our crime rate has not increased significantly in Singapore at the present moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem in tonight's debate is the difficulty of measuring motivation. There are no facts and figures. There's only two ways of measuring this. One, observe the, the people of Singapore's reaction to issues. And secondly, to study the profile of the Singaporean themselves. Now, we have shown, uh, proven our case by showing that people only respond to important and vital issues like constitutional amendments, health, money, education, crime, and social justice. The people did not respond to frivolous and inconsequential issues. If people preferred to dissent for the sake of dissenting, they would have indiscriminately chosen any issue and every issue to dissent upon. But they did not do this. They were selective, they were rational, they were discriminating. I put it to you that this shows the maturity and responsibility of all Singaporeans. Secondly, we have shown that the response was proportional to the importance of the issue. If we were silly people who like to dissent for the sake of dissenting, there would have been a riot over the threat to ban chewing gum. But we didn't see that. We saw restraint and maturity. People reacted according to the importance of the issue. Thirdly, we have shown that in some issues, there was a lack of an adequate response. Why has there been so little said about the income tax restructuring, about the discrimination women face in work, about the merger of the press and amendments of penal code? Ladies and gentlemen, if we err at all, it is because we are too conservative, too quiet, and unwilling to risk being labelled vocal gas bags. Then let us consider the nature of Singaporean society itself. We are not a nation of rabbits. We have broke the yoke of colonialism. We have accepted responsibility for our independence. We have... Um, built our nation up economically. And these attributes are still here, ladies and gentlemen. Just because the challenges and issues have changed does not mean they're less important or less worthy of dissent. Our dissent nowadays is simply a manifestation of these, our national traits. After all, it's still our same genes which make it up. It is not something new, and don't be fooled by the relative silence of the late 70s, a time of tranquility when the emphasis was on economic development. We have shown, secondly, that a more educated, sophisticated, pragmatic and articulate people with more stake in the country will be more likely to express dissent when their principles and values are trampled upon. This is even more true today when more controversial issues have been thrust upon us. And thirdly, we have shown that the government encourages only constructive and rational dissent. Unlike Don Quixote, we do not like jousting at windmills. People in Singapore, achievement-oriented people in Singapore like us, do not waste our time pursuing worthless things like dissenting for the sake of dissent. In conclusion, we would do well to remember that responsible and sincere dissent is a natural and essential process of democracy. It represents that part of us that searches for something better, a better life for ourselves and our fellow men. And Singaporeans dissent because they are ready and able to play their rightful roles in a participatory democracy. They do not dissent for the sake of dissent. I resent the insults which have been hurled at Singaporeans tonight. Thank you. The final speaker for the evening and for the series, Mr. Nathan. Mr. Ong Teng Chong, April 84. Singaporeans read only for the interest of reading headlines or stories in newspapers. They prefer to read about murder than medisafe, unquote. Ladies and gentlemen, it is this attitude that has set up a tendency for Singaporeans to dissent for the sake of dissent, even without realizing the rationale of the issue at stake. It is this attitude that has caused the Singaporean to comment unconsciously, even without realizing, even without delving into the issue concern. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a fact to be accepted. Mr. Hao Yun Chong, in yesterday's papers, said that the young urbanized professionals all commonly called as yuppies, dissent against government's policies just because they see things not falling in their ideals. From those who have nothing to lose, this attitude of being different is trendy. The crux of the matter is, happy yuppies who dissent the policies of the PAPs are dissenting for the sake of dissenting. When a tourist caught a photograph of a cute child urinating in the street, we even went to the extent of writing to the press just to exclaim, what will our foreign guests think of us? At the same time, the government's plea against doing such an act in lifts was watered down. 
If people had dissented for real causes, why don't they see to it that rigid national regulations are enforced and not nag over the matter? The argument that such a habit cannot be washed away holds no water, and so does their case. Now, all the speakers of the opposition have misconstrued the motion. We, the proposition, admit that as there are two sides to a coin, Singaporeans do dissent for other causes. We do not paint the picture of a Singaporean who thinks illogically, irrationally, and, un and is unthinking. But the motion today calls for all the speakers here to show, to highlight issues, to highlight dissent for the sake of dissent. Now, just by, pro just by proving that people dissent for other causes does not negate the motion. What are you talking about? Now, the second speaker speaks on foreign mates levy. Now, it has been quoted here, as extracted from the Strait Times, that Mr. J. Ratnam, who once supported, he once wanted foreign, work, foreign mates to come to Singapore, just made an about turn and said later to Professor Jay Kumar that he did not want to come. Talk about dissent in Parliament. Now, you say that we have much to lose at present if we dissent for the sake of dissent. We have nothing to lose at present as a matter of fact. Our basic material needs are satisfied. Ladies and gentlemen, only when one's basic material needs have been satisfied would one consider dissent to be a luxury goal. And this is what the proposition claims today. Now, you say that we did protests in the 50s and 60s, but this is dissent for a cause. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it right out of their mouth. They are admitting the fact that people did dissent in the 50s and 60s. And if you base the points as how they have put it, that is, the, as in the motion, the word has become, should be emphasized, then if there was dissent in the past for real causes, and if since we have put across facts we show that people do dissent for the sake of dissent, then the motion simply does stand. Now, Mr. Vivian, you say that the government wants to, to, wants to wants and encourage dissent with a cause. Ladies and gentlemen, they have not realized the issue at stake. Let me draw an analogy. In group dynamics, there would be one person who always dissents for the sake of dissent. And this is the idea brought about by the government as exemplified by the issue. A person who dissents for the sake of dissent in group dynamics is there to ensure that such an idea brought about would always be criticized. And this is the crux of the matter. Ladies and gentlemen, the third speaker says that we consider Singaporeans to be noise makers and gas bags. But with all sincerity, I would like to tell you, we do not consider any part of you to be irrational, unthinking, and illogical, who think illogically. We have facts. You have dissent for the sake of dissent over there. The choice is left up to you to choose the better team. I thank you. Thank you, both teams. The judges will now retire to consider their verdict. Prizes for Debate 84 have been donated by Advanced Computer Private Limited and MPH Bookstores. For the winners, a Multitake desktop computer. The runners-up will receive a Multitake MPF3 computer. Members of the winning team will also receive a $1,000 book voucher each and other finalists a $500 voucher each. All participating teams will receive book vouchers worth $50. A $500 MPH book voucher goes to the team member named as best speaker. The earlier your child begins to read, the brighter his future becomes. Because as every story unfolds, so too will his understanding of the world around him. Reading builds vocabulary, sparks curiosity, and encourages a child's imagination. All of which help him shine at school. So don't leave your child in the dark.
to give you the judge's summation, Mr. K.S. Raja. Mr. Chairman, sir, Mr. V, Mrs. Wong, ladies and gentlemen, the motion as worded is controversial in describing the dissent as fashionable and as being made for the sake of dissent. It is like eating for the sake of eating, harmful. The motion does not say dissent is a liability. On the contrary, it is implicit in the motion, in the way it has been phrased, that dissent, which is not cosmetic, is in fact desirable. Nor does the motion limit dissent to the area of politics or elaborate on any of the other attributes of dissent. Let us now see how the proposition and the opposition dealt with the subject. The proposition very correctly said that there were two parts to it, and they gave the word dissent a very wide meaning. It extended from coffee shop chatter to break dancing at Orchard Road. Any and every expression that was not regarded as the norm was regarded as a form of dissent. But how did they present their case? In presenting their case, they approached it from a historical point of view. And they said that historically, the issues on which there was dissension were fundamental issues. And because the issues were strong, they were felt strongly, and dissent was expressed strongly. They were for big causes, like freedom and independence, communism, and being against narrow chauvinism and things like that. Now, how did the opposition deal with the problem? At the very outset, the very first speaker for the opposition challenged the meaning of dissent. She said, dissent here must be taken in its more serious aspect. It must be limited to policy issues, matters affecting the rulers and the ruled. It must be over policies. Now the problem that they faced was, how do you test it? The device the, that they used was the test of motivation. And therefore, they went on to expand on this by saying, if you looked at the occasions when there were dissent in Singapore, the dissent was over important issues. Since it was put in a political context, they said that the dissent only arose when political pillars were shaken. And it was given in a manner as to ensure that the building stood to preserve the political structure. Now, this structure that was given by the first speaker was fleshed out by the second speaker. But as those of you who heard the second speaker speak will realize why the need for mechanism in parliament is sometimes necessary. <laughs> he approached it in that style. But he did, of course, flesh out the bones that were laid, very, laid down by the first speaker. And the third speaker carried on with that same theme, the fads, and to deal as a rebuttal, she began, she showed that it was more a learning process that sometimes resulted in dissent being expressed in a voice that cannot be regarded as a good form of expression. 
Now, the summing up for the opposition was done very neatly. The thoughts were organized, facts well marshaled, a certain amount of wit, and the use of gestures restrained. It was a polished performance. And the, the leading feat, the characteristic feature for the opposition was that co team coordination, for which there's 50 marks, was a very dominant feature. You could see that the arguments and the personalities have, have, were well coordinated. Now, I have made reference to the content of the proposition and the opposition. Now, it only remains for me to mention about the other aspect of the debate, namely how they said it. Now, insofar as wit, content, research, persuasive powers were concerned, we had to recognize the fact that the proposition had the more difficult task placed on them. And they approached it, I think, the right way, but the only problem was in approaching it the right way, they, to some extent, played into the hands of the opposition. Um, the, this evening, we will be having two kinds of speakers who will get awards, the best speaker and the best speaker for the series. And uh, we thought we ought to mention that the best speaker selected for this evening was an example of the kind of debater that we would like to see, not only here, but perhaps also in Parliament. Thank you. A decision. Thank you, Mr. Raja. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. The best speaker for the evening, Mr. Vivian Balakrishnan. <laughs> the best speaker for the series, Ms. Eleanor Wong. And the winning team, the National University of Singapore. <laughs> May I now call upon Mr. Wee Kim Wee to present the prizes. <laughs> Certificates of participation and a $50 book voucher for each debater from the various institutions. To receive on behalf of the Institute of Education, Team 1, Ms. Usha Jayaraja. <laughs> for the Institute of Education, Team 2, Ms. Joan Nicotta. <laughs> for the Singapore Polytechnic, Team 1, Mr. Gilbert De Silva. For the Singapore Polytechnic Team 2, Ms. Rameshwari Ramachandra. <laughs> For Nanyang Technological Institute, Mr. David Tan. <laughs> For the National University of Singapore Team 2, Ms. Dora Tan. <laughs> the best speaker for the series, a $500 book voucher, Ms. Eleanor Wong. <laughs> the runners up, Nian Polytechnic.
the National University of Singapore. and the SBC Challenge Trophy, National University of Singapore. Well, thank you for having joined us for the series. Good night and goodbye. Thank you.